Welcome to Startup Grind Little Rock. We are really glad that you're all here tonight. This is a big undertaking to get this here, and this is a great showing for the first ever Startup Grind, so thank you so much for coming. Russ is the founder and partner of Yellow Rocket Concepts, or I guess the, the uh, partner and owner of Yellow Rocket Concepts, and I'm gonna kinda let him tell you about himself, and then we'll just go from there. So this is gonna be about 30 to 40 minutes long of just Q&A, and then you guys think of your own questions to ask. We'll do a Q&A after, and then we encourage you all to be social on social media, hashtag Startup Grind LR. We're at the Innovation Hub tonight, and then you probably know all the Yellow Rocket Concepts, Twitter handles, so feel free to use those. So we'll go ahead and get it started. Um, so Russ, tell us about yourself. All right, thanks, Kim. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm from Little Rock, lived here all my life. Uh, my wife, Kim, is here, surprisingly, as if she doesn't hear me talk enough all the time anyway. But thanks. And uh, we have six kids, and they're scattered in five states in college and grad school, and one still in high school here. Um, grew up in Little Rock, graduated from Hall High School, uh, went to college at Vanderbilt, uh, took me longer than it does most students, but I got through eventually, and uh, got, went to grad school at Emory, but otherwise I've been in Little Rock. <clears throat> While in grad school, I started my first company um, uh, in, gosh, in 91, which was a company called Purple Mountain Dry Goods, and basically arose out of a, a good friend and I, when we were growing up in Little Rock, once a year we'd go out to Colorado to snow ski, and. It was always cool to ski in your blue jeans, but you froze your butt off, so uh, we came up with this idea of fleece line jeans, which are still around today, but we're certainly not profiting from it. But anyway, for a couple of years, we had a mail order clothing company and did essentially everything wrong, and, uh, but it was a good learning experience. And then I went to work for Winrock, which I guess with Winrock International shares a founder, but I was at Winrock Enterprises, which is the for-profit um, arm of Winrock uh, for a couple of years and um, had learned a lot, had a lot of fun, had a big <clears throat> kind of sale exit strategy for me. And in 2001, uh, I left Winrock and went to work at At Home Media Group, which owned At Home in Arkansas. And then we partnered with John Grisham on the Oxford American and we launched a few magazines, the now defunct Little Rock Monthly, and At Home in Memphis, which still exists. <clears throat> Sold that in, I don't really know when, maybe 2005, and spent a few years um, as a kind of passive investor in some private equity deals in particular, and uh, Jeff Stinson's here somewhere. I was on the investment committee of the Fund for Arkansas's Future for a couple of years. And I was the unpaid business advisor for about eight of my friends who had small to mid-sized businesses. And you pretty much get what you pay for with that, but I liked it. And, uh, but one of those guys in particular, uh, John Beachboard, who was one of the original founders of Zaza and Big Orange and Local Lime, and John and I had become friends, and I certainly never thought I'd get in the restaurant business, but we started getting together maybe once a month just to kind of talk about what was going on and how growth was going at the company, what the possibilities were. And I think three years ago this month, um, the opportunity came along for us to do something new together, and then I ended up um, becoming an equal partner with Scott McGee and John Beachboard <clears throat> in all of the, what are now, <clears throat> excuse me, seven restaurants and a brewery. So um, it's been a wild ride, but it's been a lot of fun. And that's how I ended up here, I guess. Perfect. Could you talk about your experience as an investor, what you would look for in people or the companies? Yeah, and, and I think this is, um, and I, Jeff certainly could support this, but it's kind of counterintuitive but I think when you're a fund or if you're a venture capitalist or an angel fund or a private equity investor, if you look at enough deals over time, what you're really looking for is more the team than the idea. So I think there's this misconception about starting a company and in part probably 
Um, a lot of what's gone on in Silicon Valley in the past 20 years, you know, some of those guys really have gotten rock star status and it's been glamorized and, um, and certainly a lot of what they've done out there has been paradigm changing, although I think they learned they hadn't changed the world as much as they thought they had at one point. But I think in general, startups are not really about reinventing the wheel. You know, you'd, uh, I meant to look it up ahead of time, but I didn't. But that saying, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Well, a lot of people have been created cool mousetraps over the past hundred years and little electronic ones with closing doors and Wi-Fi. And pretty much still, if you want to get rid of a mouse, you go to the hardware store and buy a 79 cent little spring loaded deal that you put cheese on. So I don't, you know, certainly people will come up with disruptive technologies and that's a whole separate area of startups. My startups have been a mail order clothing company, um, a few magazines, and now some restaurants and a brewery. And I think that's more the norm. So I think that when you, as a venture capitalist or a potential investor, someone comes to you with an idea for a new company, if you're smart, you're looking a lot more at who that person is or who that team is than their idea. You know, starting a company can be opening a corner grocery store or it can be an idea you have for some baseball caps. But what's, there are gonna be tough times, you know, as we all know, and really it's about resilience and hard work and um, being willing to pivot a little bit, which is a big buzzword these days, but I think that's right. I think if you write a business plan, all we know for sure is that's not how it's gonna go. So whether it's more or less than you expected or it's different or you put out something as an afterthought that takes off. But I, I think the people are the most important, um, certainly you as a potential founder, but your team or whoever, that's what matters the most. And even if your idea doesn't work out, um, a good team, you know, I, I'd be willing to bet on them again if they were the right people because everybody has failures. But I, I do think that that's, it's not about the glamour, 99, at least it hadn't been in my life, and 99% of the time I think it's about the hard work and doing what you say you're gonna do. And um, as I always say, you know, entrepreneurs only have to work half days and you can pick which 12 hours that is. So. Do you think there's a right or wrong way to start a business? What's that? Um, uh, first of all, I don't, I don't think there's any one right answer to any of this, particularly when it comes to starting and running small businesses. So if somebody tells you they have all the answers, I would run away from that person. So I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think that um, trying to, I think that if you think you have something that you have to launch huge, because everybody else is gonna see what a great idea it is, and you need to make this land grab for market share or front of mind in consumers' minds. That's unlikely. It's not impossible. But I think starting smaller and proving your concept, maybe while you're still at your existing job or um, is generally the way to go because you're gonna learn a lot that first year or two. And starting out with a lot of money may sound fun, but it, it kind of uh, over-dramatizes your mistakes and made, makes them a little more cataclysmic. So. I, I personally think in general, starting small um, makes sense. You get to prove your concept, you get to prove there's a market for it, and you're just not gambling as much. Okay, so talking about starting out as an entrepreneur, can you sort of just talk about the importance of mentors and partners and how to find them? Yeah, absolutely. So really, two separate questions there. Mentors are great. Um, you, can, you can find them in this room. Um, I really, you know, there, there's certainly famous entrepreneurs in this world who've made a lot of money who are not nice people. I think that's the exception. And I think having a network of friends is important, not just because they're potential future customers, but, and not just because maybe it's an indicator of how you're gonna treat employees anyway, but it's good to build a network. And certainly if you have ideas of starting a company that maybe you know something about the product or the market, but you're not the expert in manufacturing it or um, importing it or whatever, or the raw materials. It's good to build relationships in those areas. I think, I think successful people are more open to that than you think they are. 
They probably don't get asked as often as you think they do. Um, there's certainly times in people's lives when they're particularly open to that, I think, towards the end of their careers. But even young, successful people, uh, I think people are, in general, in business, a lot more collaborative than people would think. And so it's not us against them at all. And so I would look for mentors here, online, um, local events, show up on their business doorstep and befriend them. You know, you, they probably don't want to help too much somebody who's going to be a competitor next door. But a lot of business is kind of applicable across industries. So I think if there's somebody you admire who seems to really do a good job, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. So partners, different um, question. I had, um, I've had mixed experience with partners, but uh, my current experience is fantastic. And I will say that a big reason for that is that we all have really different roles. So we have two other partners in the business, um, one in the brewery and one in two of the restaurants. Um, but the three main partners that were equal partners in everything, John Beachford and Scott McGee and me, we have a great partnership because we're all good at different things. And that's great to have. And, you know, look, they ran very successful restaurants before I came along. So I listened to them on business stuff, which is more my area. They act like they're listening to me about beer and food. I don't know if they really are, but it's nice of them to, you know, pretend. But partners are great. Partners are great if you get to the point where you can take a two week vacation. You know, partners are great to have different perspective and bounce ideas off of. And it doesn't have to be um, a partner with equal ownership, but I think having valued team members is a big deal. Okay, and back to the mentor part of that question, you know, can you talk about a mentor you had growing up or maybe right now, and then do you feel like right now you're a mentor to people? Sure, so um, first of all, I was really blessed that um, I had a father who grew up um, in Hot Springs, Arkansas, certainly not very well off, and uh, got a Navy scholarship to Georgia Tech and then served in the Navy, and um, probably unusually for someone of that era, um, and I think at his wife's insistence, because he probably would have been happy to be gone at sea six months of the year and, and liked some things about the Navy a lot. But anyway, applied to and got in Harvard Business School, and so I, and, and just a phenomenal father and they're both phenomenal parents. So I was, you know, just the ideal situation for wanting to go into business and be an entrepreneur because I literally, I, I think he's a, he's a man who could have run Microsoft or Apple or, and did really well, but, but he was just, and I worked for him for a couple of years and he had that perfect balance of letting me make decisions, but being there if I needed advice which again, that, uh, that's a tough uh, line to walk as an employer, let alone as a parent. The other person I would cite is a man who's deceased. He, uh, Harper Boyd was a professor of marketing emeritus at Stanford University and Northwestern in Chicago, which is probably the best marketing school in the country. And later in life, he married a woman from Little Rock, Virginia Boyd, and uh, moved to Little Rock. And I just happened to get to know Harper and. He took an interest in me and my kind of business ambitions. So, um, and, and I would say that there are a, a few people that I mentor. Um, I still have a couple of private in equity investments and in small things. And then, like I said, I've got six kids. So I, I feel like I'm on that every day. Okay, so, okay, a couple of things there. Um, you talked about your childhood a little bit, and I'm interested in your education background because you're an English major, undergrad. Right and so was I. And can you talk about, I know we talk a lot about pivots in your business, but can you talk about in your life pivots you've made and how did you get here from an English degree? Sure, so um, first of all, I went to Vanderbilt on a math scholarship and the girls were a lot cuter in the English classes. Just kidding, baby. Um, but, uh, so I had a very strong quantitative background and my testing quantitatively is much higher than my verbal. Um, but I, I wouldn't, uh, uh, if you're a math major in college, you pretty quickly get into math that's not really relevant to everyday life unless you want to teach math. And so I had the perfect background for reading spreadsheets and looking at financial statements. 
but I loved English literature and ended up getting a degree in um, Irish and Southern literature from Vanderbilt, which I loved. But as I told Kim the other day, when I got to graduate business school, I got my MBA at Emory, the ability to communicate, um, particularly in writing, but in general was such a huge advantage, even in business school. And it helped that I was strong quantitatively, but I just, um, I, and I still find that true today at 53, you know, in business, whether it's emails or whether it's a press release for your small business, the ability to communicate is such an important skill. So yeah, uh, I think it really, the combination of an English degree and an MBA just turned out to be perfect for me. Okay, and with six kids, can you talk about your work-life balance? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, and, and people who know me know this, but I'm all about the kids. And uh, I hadn't really thought of it this way, but about 10 years ago, my dad looked at me and said, do you ever play golf? And I said, no, I don't play any golf. And I said, I, you know, I said, I really don't have any hobbies except for work. And he laughed and he said, well, your hobby is your kids. And truly really true. I mean, I, you know, I, as, as much as anyone I know, I've enjoyed every age from newborn to 27. Um, it's an interesting point about kids, which I tell a lot of our managers, is that uh, Kim and I have six kids. They could not be more different from each other. And they respond to different stimuli. So some may really respond to, you know, my threats to kill them that afternoon. And some may really respond to the idea that they'll get a new iPhone if they do well. And it, it's really a carrot and stick deal, but so many shades of gray in the middle. And employees are like that. We have 470 employees now at Yellow Rocket, which kind of blows my mind, but they all are coming from different places in their life. They all respond to different things. Some are about the money, some need praise. And as a good manager, you got to figure that out quickly. If you just, if you have one parenting style and you have multiple kids or you just have one kid, I guess it's luck of the draw whether or not it works. But if, if you want to be good at it, you better learn to adapt. And it's really the same in managing people. I mean, you can have five people with identical backgrounds and um, there are different things that make them tick. And you got to pick up on that and figure out what people need to really get the most out of them and for them to get the most out of their job. Okay, and this is something that you and I talked about a little before too, but social entrepreneurship and the idea of giving back and you had some interesting insight. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, hey, I mean, I can't sit up here and say social entrepreneurship doesn't matter, you know, and, and it does matter and it's a big deal, but I sometimes think what gets lost and, and you know, my views on this have changed over time. Um, there are some great companies out there, whether it's Patagonia giving 10% of profits or companies that give 1% of revenues. Um, but I think what often gets overlooked in the shuffle, and this is a big mantra of mine, is the importance of job creation and how you treat your employees. And, you know, as you grow and if you have the privilege of managing a lot of people, um, they're just that, they're people. They're not, and I'm not trying to be cliche or saying I'm perfect about this, but they're not numbers on a spreadsheet. and. Is someday you're going to have to let somebody go. It's no fun. But you still got to remember that person may have a spouse or kids or a mortgage payment. And that's a huge responsibility. And so, you know, I, I kind of think that um, that doesn't get lost in the shuffle. But I think being able to provide jobs to people, well-paying jobs, jobs where they have a chance to advance, um, that's, I'm not trying to get too trickle down economics on you, but that's a big deal. And they support you know, their local grocery store and they buy a house. And so yes, social entrepreneurship's a big deal. It needs to be legitimate. You need to find something you're passionate about and that your people can give not only you know, corporate dollars, but their hours too. And, and you probably should talk to your people about that rather than tell them which you um, are passionate about. I remember at the media company, several people wanted to make the zoo our deal, and I hate zoos. 
Sorry. But, I, you know, I, I let myself get overruled on that because they all felt strongly about it. So I, I think social entrepreneurship is important. I think, um, I think particularly millennials, but pretty much everyone can see through it if you're just doing it to try and build your business. Um, so I think it has to be legitimate. But again, I just think there's so much value in employing people, treating those people well, giving them opportunities they may have never had otherwise. It's a big deal. So on the topic of management, I'm sure we have people in the room tonight who are building companies and probably need advice on how to hire people, who to, you know, what qualities to look for, and then do you have advice, I mean, on how to be a good manager? You, you know, again, there, uh, there's, there's no right answer to this. I know a guy in town who runs a, a now sold, but ran a very successful company but about six times a year, he would go off to a management seminar and he would come back with some new, this is it, this is how you manage, you know, open book or name somebody the blueberry muffin of the month or, you know, whatever it is. And don't do that. You know, find what works for you. It's an individual thing, but um, certainly be true to yourself. Uh, I remember reading about a guy 10 or 20 years ago who lease some space and he'd hired three or four employees and their first office space was completely empty and he walked in the room and he put a, a milk crate on the floor and he stood on top of it and he told them we're going to be the biggest company in the world and it actually I think ended up being a humongous company but he, he meant it you know that was him um, but he, you know if that's not you if you're not a shout from the mountaintops type of person that doesn't matter. People want authenticity. They want to know who you are. They want to know where the company's headed. They really want to know how they fit into that picture. You know, even an entry level person, you know, and so yeah, and that's that's a dual edged sword too. I mean, don't over promise on that stuff, you know. Don't don't hire somebody and say you'll be a manager next year. You know, give them realistic goals, let them grow with the company. Hiring's tough. Um, there are a lot of talented, good people out in the marketplace. You're going to make mistakes with that. And I think for a small company, even though it's, it's kind of um, seems harsh, but it's really not because you're doing them a favor too. But once you realize someone's not the right fit for your company, make that change. Make it today. You know, don't procrastinate on that because you're dragging yourself down. You're dragging them down. Um, but hopefully most of them won't work out that way and they'll work out positively. But I do think that the more you communicate on the front end about their job and about what the company's doing, the greater likelihood you have of finding that right fit. Okay, um, you had a note you know, in our correspondence that some people probably aren't equipped to start their own companies. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what do you mean by that? And what kinds of people are ready to start their own company? Yeah, so, um, you, you know, there are a million types of people in life, but the people who should start a company or work, even work for a small company, you know, if you're a procrastinator, it's probably not a good call. I mean, I, I procrastinate, you know, everybody procrastinates. My wife just raised her eyebrows at me. I procrastinate a lot. But you can't procrastinate on the important stuff. And really, if you've got something you're dreading sitting in front of you, man, you just need to knock it out. And I think that small business owners, um, a little ADD probably helps because you're going to wear a lot of hats. And I think it's just uh, for a small business owner, you can't be all about stability and certainty and comfort. You just can't. And that's part of the excitement too, obviously. I mean, look, starting, I mean, starting a small company, man, that's a good drug, no doubt. I mean, it's awesome. Um, but if you want to wake up each morning and know what your eight hours are going to look like and, you know, at five o'clock you're done and you don't think about it, I mean, it seems obvious to say, but it's surprising the people who have that mentality but still think they want to start a company because we have glamorized it and we've paved it as a path to riches. And that's, don't, I mean, I, actually, I didn't know what Startup Grind was, so I went online and watched one on YouTube, one of these fireside chats, and I don't know who the guy was, I'm sure I'm supposed to know, but 
Um, he had, you know, when he was six years old, he like had a chain of lemonade stands. And when he was 15, he had 45,000 in cash under his bed. And um, I think that's the exception too. If you're starting a small company because you want to get rich, go buy some lottery tickets. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it could work out. The stars may line up, but um, I'd say in particular exits, successful exits are hard selling a company for money that on an after-tax basis you can reinvest and still make what you were making owning the company, man, that's rare. So uh, should you expect good financial rewards for working 60 to 80 hours a week? Absolutely. But if, you're, if your goal is to get rich, I think that's tough and I think people see through that. I think if you see a need in the marketplace you wanna fill, or if there's a product you're passionate about and you wanna do that, you're a lot more likely to make a lot of money than you are if you just set out to make money. Okay, I think we're about ready to open it up to Q&A, but I have a quick question for you. Could you talk a little bit more just about your ventures in the magazine industry and just talk about it, what you experienced and why you transitioned away from that? Sure, so, um... I started um, at home in Arkansas, I actually started across the parking lot from Winrock and our real estate company advertised in their first issue. So I got to know those people and um, in 2001, uh, Winrock had a largely outside board of directors and I was the CEO and, and we had a significant sale um, of most of our business and I told our board, I said, look, I'm not leaving tomorrow. I own a small percentage of this company. I'm not going to be here three years from now. I'm not going to pour myself, you know, into something, uh, really reinventing the company again, owning that little and which great, perfectly amicable and um, started talking to what was then really just at home in Arkansas and ended up uh, buying into the magazine and it, it was um, it was it was great. It was and this there is a great lesson in this actually. So it was good. It had great revenues. It was profitable. It had good people. So we decided to launch a city magazine, um, which most cities bigger than Little Rock have, whether it's Dallas or Chicago or whatever. So we launched Little Rock Monthly. So we launched Little Rock Monthly as where at home in Arkansas was today. So with, you know, 120 pages and perfect bound. And so we didn't have the advertising base to support that. And we never got there. So I think, again, getting back to the virtues and value of starting small, that was a good lesson that just because we had a magazine doing that successfully, we still should have launched Little Rock Monthly Small and more grassroots and built it up and it was a cool, beautiful magazine that we really couldn't afford to put out each month. And it was heartbreaking for me when we closed it. I love publishing. Um, there's so much competition, as y'all know, for ad dollars today. And, and that's what, that's what, when you pick up a magazine, it may seem like it's all ads, but it's less than 50% ads because you can't afford to mail it otherwise because the Postal Service has some regulations about that. But uh, ad dollars are so tough and I'm a lover of magazines, but I gotta tell you, when, when someone comes to sell me a magazine ad, and I say, how will I know what the response rate is? You really don't. I mean, it's, it, you're building the brand, but there's not a call to action usually. There's not a coupon. And now there's online, and, um, you know, let alone all the traditional billboards and TV and radio, and, um, and online's become a huge deal. So, and we don't do much advertising at Yellow Rocket. So, um, the, uh, I guess I got away from magazine publishing. I still had my hand in some other things and I got a good offer to sell the magazine from some people who were still passionate about it and I was not. And so I knew that's when it was time to move on. And, um, but a lot of good lessons there and uh, fun, you know, much like the restaurant and brewery business, a lot of fun creative, dynamic, crazy people. So, and on that note, how, what kind of advice would you give to people? How do you know when to move on and when to keep, you know, your company going if you know that it's probably time to do something else? I think if you were the company owner and founder, 
and you're not waking up fired up every day about that business, um, that's a problem. And that's going to, unless you're an absentee owner who has good management in place, even still though, uh, I, I just, I think people look to you and they feed off you and how you treat customers or employees or, man, that, that filters down. So um, I think if you, I think if you've lost that passion, maybe you, maybe you need to step away for a week or a month and you'll rekindle it and find it again. But if you're going through a long lull, yeah, it's, it's probably time to do something else. And some people maintain that excitement and fervor for 40 years. I don't think I'm bad about that. I mean, I love what I'm doing now. I, I suspect I'll be doing it a long time. But if you lose that, it's probably time to move on. Okay, we're going to go ahead and open it up for Q&A. Just raise your hand and we'll kind of point you out and feel free to ask. Yeah, Mike. So Mike asked, I think I'm supposed to repeat the question, are any of our concepts at a point where they're ready to go big? Um, you know, we get approached by people who want to franchise or want to buy. Um, that's, that's not my philosophy. I don't think it's my partner's philosophy. I would much rather end up owning 10 restaurants than having 200 franchisees or um, we're real hands-on. Uh, I, I know a couple of people in here are in or around that business. It, it, the restaurant business is every bit as hard as people say it is. And everything matters. The food matters, the service matters, the location matters, the experience matters, the space matters, social media matters, reinventing your menu matters, having the local ingredients matters. I don't know, we're getting ready to do we hadn't signed leases yet, but it's no big secret. We're getting ready to do two restaurants in Northwest Arkansas. I'm a little anxious about it. We've got some great people to go up there. It's three hours away, but all of our restaurants right now, I can be in and Scott can be in and John can be in, be in every day. And we are, and I hope it shows. You know, we are really meticulous. We, we sit down a couple of times a week and talk about every aspect of those businesses. Who are we buying tomatoes from? You know, what's available locally? Who's going to the farmer's market? Are our people smiling? You know, are they greeting people? How long is our ticket time? We're real hands-on. I don't think you could do that with 100 restaurants. I don't know what the magic number is, but we'll stop growing when we hit it because that's not fun. I grew up, when I grew up, Chili's was a new thing. The cheese dip wasn't even on the menu. It was a secret menu item. Um, and I remember going into Chili's in Florida one time and saying I wanted the queso and the waitress said, we don't have queso. She was new. I was like, ask your manager. And uh, I have a cheese dip problem. But <laughs> I, I went in a Chili's the other day, not here, and it just sucked. And I mean, the service was horrible, the restaurant was filthy, the food was bad, and I'm not condemning Chili's. I mean, Brinker does a great job. It's hard to manage any business that grows so far away and the tentacles get so long. So I don't know, Mike, we're gonna, um, we'll probably do our third Big Orange soon. Um, when I came to the restaurant group and John and Scott, and I really was kind of of the mindset Let's find our one or two best restaurants and build a bunch of them. And uh, Scott in particular said, you know what we've always done is we found a location or a market and we've kind of built a restaurant to fit that. And it keeps us energized and it keeps the creative juices flowing. And I'm 100% on board with that. That's a, we don't want to do mediocre restaurants. Not that we have the greatest restaurants in the world. We don't delude ourselves about that. But I can promise you, we pour ourselves into those restaurants and that brewery every day. And so if we gave up control or if we had franchisees, I'm sure that's a better path to riches, but it's not how we roll at all. So I, I don't think it'll happen. Yes, sir. Corey. Hi. Uh, Corey Wilkins. Uh, you mentioned something about introducing a disruptor or some, a new technology or whatever, and you've chosen paths that are almost like fast follow, fast follow models, right? Like existing businesses, right. restaurants, absolutely, clothing, 
Right. And, uh, you know, obviously, I think your, your brewery is one that, is, there is a little bit of a fast follow, but that is definitely one that's, that I've seen and followed over years. But those just crash and burn very, very quickly. Obviously. Sure. So as someone that's creating technology that's a disruptor, uh, and your advice, if you have advice, as it's your private equity or private sure. investment, um, what is any advice that you can impart on somebody that actually is trying to introduce a right. new product or a new technology that could actually change the face in which we get emergency help? So if right. you just you know, talk to that. Absolutely, and I didn't mean to demean that in any way. I just don't have any great ideas like that. So, And I don't want people to think that the startup process requires you to reinvent the world, but it's certainly cool when you can. Um, what was it uh, Steve Jobs said to Scully when he was hiring him away from Pepsi, do you want to sell sugar water the rest of your life or do you want to change the world? So obviously there's so much admirable in, in new technologies, ones that benefit mankind even better, but uh, that's the cool, fun stuff. Um, you, I don't know that I have anything revolutionary to say about that, except that that is an area, obviously, where sometimes it pays to establish, you know, a beachfront as quickly as possible, um, because people will copy your ideas. I know nothing about patent protection, but it obviously matters there. But I think, um, I think in, in a little bit of what you mentioned, it's real important. It's really easy, and I do this. Um, my wife, uh, we just went on a vacation for her birthday which is great because I'm not good at doing that. And uh, for the first three days, I actually didn't think about the business that much. And by the fourth day, I was thinking about the business a lot, but I had a different perspective. And where I'm going with my long-winded answer is, it's, it's easy to convince yourself that you have a world-changing product, and, and you may, but it's still important, and I'm sure you've seen this, to get feedback from customers. Probably more important by far in the type of thing you're talking about to make sure what you make fits their needs. And I hate the word scalable, but that's somewhere that it applies. So, um, and again, you know, it, I'll say this, finances are important. And you don't have to be an accountant, you don't have to have an MBA, but if you rely completely on someone else understanding what's going on with your money, it's easy to get in trouble. And so as you grow, um, and it's certainly been said a lot about startups, but cash flow is probably more important than profits a lot of the time because you can be the most profitable company in the world and go out of business for lack of cash flow. But I think as you're scaling a new technology, um, finding the right partners, I don't, I may have imagined, I think you alluded to something medical. But no, okay, so I did imagine that. So let's say, but let's say you have some medical device. You know, then maybe it becomes really important to have a mentor who's in the medical field. Maybe nothing related to you, but maybe they sit on a hospital board or they could introduce you to people. I think with the acceptance of new technology, it's, it's great to jump over that fence to where the customers are before you're selling them a product and really build that relationship or relationships. Sure, thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. Hi, Hi um, you can mention the importance of finding the right mentors. Um, as a first time entrepreneur, it seems like it's not hard to find people who have an opinion on what you should do or which direction you should focus on. How do you filter through that noise and find, find the right voices or the right mentors for you? So I think that, I think it's more important to find a mentor who's gonna give you good advice on building a company than it is someone who's going to give you good advice on kind of what you should be doing and what you should be selling and um, it's it's and Kim's heard a little of this rant from me already but I'm not look I get I get it business plans are awesome elevator pitches are awesome competitions are awesome if you suck at those things, I'm not sure it has any bearing on whether or not you'll be successful as an entrepreneur. And the converse is true. If you're amazing at those things, maybe you start a company helping people write business plans. It, and it's not that there's not value in thought going into it, but you're gonna be wrong 
It's good to be realistic. Basic economics matter. If you buy a widget for a dollar, you need to sell it for more than a dollar. You know, so basic economics matter, but I don't, it's not that I don't value, well, I don't value focus groups, but it's not that I don't value other people's input, but I think on certain product decisions or where you're headed or where you're going, trust your instincts. You know, believe in yourself, believe in your partners. Um, you know, scalability is this huge deal that in Silicon Valley, you know, Google doesn't want to invest in you if you can't be a billion dollar company. I mean, who thought the pet rock was going to be huge? I mean, if you have a product or an idea that just 10 people in your neighborhood want, there's a good chance there's a lot of people in the world who want that. So um, I didn't really answer your question of how to find a good mentor. There are, um, when you're in the restaurant business, it's kind of amazing how many people have good ideas for restaurants. So I know what you're talking about. I, I, I get those phone calls a lot. Um, and in the restaurant business, like everything else I'm talking about, we didn't invent the hamburger, we didn't invent pizza, we didn't invent Mexican food. We just work really, really hard at it. And we're never gonna be perfect, but man, we strive to be perfect and everybody to go away extremely satisfied. So I, I think that there are, I think you need to develop your own filter for what to take away from a mentor. You can, I mean, I can remember, as I've said, my dad's one of the smartest business people I know, and he told me the brewery was the dumbest idea ever. And it's, and, and John's dad said the same thing, and it's really been John and my baby, and, and it's been great, it's been fun, and um, even though I, I agree it's kind of a ubiquitous model, but craft beer's been a little disruptive, um, I think permanently going forward, and as far as what people expect from a beer, whether it's fresh ingredients or local or, um, but uh, there's no magic answer on the mentors, but I think you've got to maybe learn to take and choose different things from different people. You're probably not going to find the, you know, godfather of your industry who wants to hang out with you 10 hours a week. Um, but there will be people who know something about it. And I think it's, again, just kind of, you got to trust your, you got to trust yourself a lot. You're going to have doubters. Um, if you have a spouse or kids, look, this is tough stuff. And they may be wired differently than you are as far as stability or the kids getting tired of ramen or, you know, whatever. I mean, you're all in it together. So it, it's certainly easier to start a company when you're young and you don't have a mortgage and two car payments. And, um, but do it anyway. I mean, it's so freaking great. It really is. I mean, it's just nothing like it. Mike. Hey, Mike. So <laughs> nice. Um, you, you have you have really um, jumped into and made decisions around industries that are hard as hell to make work. If you think about publishing, restaurants, breweries, uh, could you talk a little bit about what that decision process was that that got you to the point to to make that leap into those areas? And then secondly, do you still have your addictive addiction from back in the rock? Yeah, so for the first question, the second question first, absolutely. So we we um, won the World Cheese Dip Championships the past weekend. Probably the biggest thrill of my life. I like my kids fine, but probably the biggest thrill of my life. Um, and uh, as Mike knows, I grew up eating at the Taco Kid on Cantrell, which was open for about 10 or 12 years. And every Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month at Local Lime, we recreate those recipes and I'm sure if you didn't grow up on it and you came in and ordered it now, you'd think it's complete crap, but please don't tell me that. Um, but yeah, cheese dip has been a recurring theme throughout my life. And as a matter of fact, when we had Little Rock Monthly Magazine, I wrote the monthly cheese dip report, so um, where you could learn a lot more about my childhood than you would ever want to know. What was the first question now? Oh, how we do industries. So, I don't, you know, I, I, I have, um, I have certain things that I'm really good at, and I think that's good to know about yourself. So I'm a good generalist. I get marketing, I get HR, um, I get manufacturing. I think I'm good with people. I'm really good with numbers and finance, but what I think I'm best at is business strategy. So what I mean by that is, if you have $10,000 to spend 
What I'm really good at is taking in a whole bunch of information, and I'm not perfect at this at all, but this is my skill. I'm good at taking in just tons of disparate information and filtering it down and saying, here's what I think we should do. Whether that's marketing or whether that's product or whether that's people or locations, that's what, that's what I think I'm best at. So I didn't, um, I know the restaurant industry's tough. I didn't, uh, also know there are restaurants that make money. So I think that my thinking on that was, uh, I have two good partners who know the restaurant industry well. They kind of lack some of what I have. I lack all of what they have when it comes to the restaurant business, but it's, it's been a really good team. On the brewery deal, uh, John Beachboard and I were sitting on my back porch one night and he was throwing out ideas or things we could do next. And this was before I was an investor. And like, I don't remember, dairy farm or, you know, vertical integration. And Scott and John and I all still have kids at home, so we weren't looking to do something in Texas or California. Um, and he said, craft brewery. And I just said, that's freaking genius. You know, what we have, and, and obviously we knew the industry was exploding but what we had, A, we had a lot of craft beer customers. We were really good at uh, manipulation of ingredients and how they go together. We were really good at sterilization, which is huge for small breweries. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges for small breweries is consistency. And that can be anything from the change in water temperature or pH balance throughout the year. But more commonly, it's sterilization, how they clean their hoses how they clean their tanks. Also, and Grant, who's here, could tell you a lot more about this than I could. But it also has to do with your ingredients and your suppliers, and, and we were really good at all of those things already, having relationships with big suppliers, getting consistent ingredients. So it didn't seem scary to us. Um, I think that's, um, as women describe childbirth, you know, they forget how awful it was, which is what allows them to have another child sometimes. Um, the true, true in this uh, or in these businesses you've described, you know, I'm not smart enough to realize ahead of time how hard they're going to be. So you dive in and then it's too late when you figure it out. So I don't, um, he, here's one piece of advice I'd give if you hear a business is really easy or if you're picking up Inc. Magazine or Fast Company or Forbes or Fortune and all the articles are saying you should get into some business, don't do that because that'll be the impossible business because eight million people are jumping in it and it's uh, gonna get really hard really fast. Picking out ones that everybody thinks are hard, that probably scares a lot of people off. Um, they are, uh, publishing was a hard business, but we uh, made it successful. Uh, the restaurant business has been good to us and, and brewing so far. Um, I remember a friend of mine, we had been open about six months and he said that a brewery out of state had asked him to go on its board of directors and and he said, you know, ultimately I just decided not to because I couldn't figure out how to make money in that business. And I thought, I mean, we're not making a ton of money, but we're making money. You know, I mean, why are they in it for 10 years if they can't figure out how to make money? Is that their gift back to the community? Or you, you gotta you gotta be self-sustaining. So not a great answer to your question, but I think, I think, I don't know if it's true when I was growing up that some businesses were easier, but man, everything's competitive now. You know, everything. And, and the internet's been the great democratizer in a lot of businesses. And that's awesome for the consumer. And it can be a great tool for you, but everything's competitive. And the knowledge base is huge. And so I don't know businesses that aren't anymore. And I just have a quick follow-up question to Mike's. Um, before this, Amber told me that you only drink milk and Coke. Um, is that true? And do you drink the beer at Lost 40? That's kind of personal. Um, it is a personal. I should have warned you. So, I'm sorry. Um, first of all, I, I don't drink much alcohol. I do drink every one of our beers. I think I've got a decent palate for beer. Um, and I, I like it. I've, I've never been a big alcohol drinker, even when I was a kid. If I drink alcohol, it'll be a beer. 
Um, I end up drinking some beer every week just because I don't want to, you know, tell people what our beer tastes like, and I just tell them what someone else has told me. Um, and I may have a different take on it. So uh, I drink a lot of skim milk. Um, I'm, I've cut back. I was one to two gallons a day. Um, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, it, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it means something. I, I really don't know what that means. And Cokes uh, uh, have tried to cut back to one a day. Um, I, I'm really kind of a believer that uh, our children's generation is going to view sugar the way we view cigarettes. And I, I think that sugar is probably the cause of a lot of problems in life, but it, it tastes pretty good too. So, um, but I do drink the beer. I mean, I've had a frozen mojito at Heights Taco and it was delicious, but I'm, I'm really not much of a liquor drinker, but I totally get the beer. And um, I think I'm a pretty addictive personality type anyway. So maybe it's not great, you know, maybe you don't get high on your own supply. Maybe it's good that I don't have six beers a day. I don't know. Okay, Christine, this is our last question. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so particularly the restaurants, we're in a service industry. Um, this is, uh, it, it feels weird to say it in a public setting, but I'll put it out there because of its value. We believe, and I think people know this about us, super strongly in diversity to the extent that we've gotten involved in some political issues along those lines. Um, and I will say that having a really diverse workforce it's not just a great altruistic thing to do. It's really, it benefits us. Um, I, think, I think we're certainly known for it and it's not just because we're trying to be known for it, but we want to know, um, we want people to know whether it's racial or sexual preference or religious or any other, you know, we're a diverse community and we want to reflect that. And I really think that has yielded tangible benefits not being known for that, but having that diverse workforce. Um, and I think it's reflected in our managers and our assistant managers and our staff and our kitchen staff and um, our customer base is diverse. I think they get that. I think they appreciate that. So I'm not telling anybody how to live their life, but I would say if you get to 500 employees and you hadn't reflected diversity, I mean, you haven't embraced diversity, that's a problem. So it's it's something that's, the, the good news for me is it's equally important to all three of the owner partners. Um, we do have good people, we lose people. Um, I think it's important, again, I can't emphasize enough, I think it's important that people feel valued, that they get tangible rewards. Um, we, I think we are, Fortunate in that people want to work for our restaurants and our brewery. I don't, I mean, we've had almost no turnover at the brewery since the start. It's kind of amazing. Um, and we've just attracted some really amazing, talented people. And there's, um, I won't get into politics at all, but if you are a manager and you don't get that the more people you surround yourself with who are brighter than you, if you don't get the value of that, you're not gonna go anywhere unless you can just work 500 hours a week and even then people aren't gonna to wanna to hang with you. But man, it's all about the people. And, and that's, I think that's probably my greatest strength as a manager. I'm not perfect at it. I yell at people, I get upset, but I really value our employees and I'm thrilled they're there and I'm thrilled that they entrust us with such a big part of their lives. And um, maybe that'll keep us from growing super fast too, because we're pretty, even though we make mistakes, we're pretty selective about that. But it's, it's our single biggest critical success factor is our people. Okay, so to wrap it up tonight, what is one piece of advice you could leave with us? Well, not to, uh, I have two, I'm gonna cheat. Um, and one is, um, it's just that, and I think I've beaten a dead horse, I realize, but it's, if you, being kind is probably the wrong word, but you gotta, 
whether it's your employees or your customers, I mean, you got to value them so much. Um, and I just think that's the people who really sucked at that in the past. I think I think you get exposed more quickly these days, which is great. Um, but the other piece of advice I would get, give is that if you're thinking about starting a business and you're analyzing it and looking at the market and the environment and where your funds are going to come from, that's great. But at some point, if you're not careful, you're going to be on the sidelines the rest of your life. Just freaking jump in and do it. I mean, it's great. If you fail, so what? It's just... You'll learn a lot in the process, and I think that's just my biggest message. If you're if you're thinking about it, is do it. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. It means a lot to us that you came. Oh, thank um, you. Thanks again to our sponsors, and thank you guys for coming out to the first startup grind. Our next one will be November fifteenth. Um, feel free to hang around and network after this. We have coffee and I think beer in the back still. Okay, yes, we do. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Mike and Mike, y'all don't get any more. You're cut off. Thank you all.